Hello everyone, welcome to our last panel of this year's Octacon. Um, you've seen that we're, we're impressively titled the solar panel, building a hopeful future. And um, we all want to live in a future where massive solar panels in space use microwaves to bring down free sustainable power to our luxurious floating cities. Our panelists discuss the science and activism that can help us move on from our gas guzzling, oil extracting, unsustainable past and present. Um, so that's a, a big way of, of getting into talking all about energy, optimism and the future. Um, I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves. So I'm going to start with Vanessa. Hi, I'm Vanessa. <laughs> I, I, I am a mechanical engineer and a storyteller. My day job is in the electric power industry. Uh, so I've been coping with all this stuff for uh, many, many years. And in my book, all that was asked. Mm. The main character's family is a powerful conglomerate that runs massive power sets <laughs> that run their world. So, and they're also a crime syndicate, but that's another story. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Harun? Hi, uh, I'm Harun. I, I'm an academic um, in electronic engineering, uh, working on uh, problems of control, cyber physical systems, and unconventional communications, uh, energy harvesting, etc. And uh, when not doing that, I try to write. I think we all try that. Uh, Oshin. Um, well, I'm a, a full-time writer and illustrator, um, writing for basically anybody from first-time reader upwards. Um, and uh, I illustrate in a range of styles. And my work has been kind of increasingly uh, influenced by environmental issues over the last 10 years or so. Um, so the last couple of books I've worked on have had environmental themes, in, including the most recent, which is a short hopeful guide to climate change. Uh, my first non-fiction book, which was an interesting experience. And um, yeah, so it's, it's um, I do a lot of work with kids and for kids. And uh, that's my main focus when it comes to kind of exploring these, these issues. Okay, thanks. And, and Noelle? Hi, I'm Noelle and I'm a sci-fi fan. I read, I write a few scribbles sometimes, mainly sci-fi. I'm also involved in con running and particularly the Glasgow in 2024 World Con bid, which log I'm all logoed up to date with that. Um, as far as climate activism is concerned, I just find myself more and more um, active as the years go by, um, kind of listening to my kids being down about the climate and then and, and, and the change maybe that's coming and feeling kind of, oh my God, what, did I, what am I doing to them? Uh, but trying to get involved then with a few strands, like there's a biodiversity group in my local GA club, and I'm also involved in the Green Party and their forestry policy group and a few other bits and pieces. Um, in terms of professionally, I do work in the electricity industry. So I apologize now if I, if I talk mainly about electricity and not so much about heat and transport, but I suppose it, a lot of the policies leading to a low carbon future are about electrification of heat and transport. So electricity is coming more and more into it. Okay. Um, so I'm your moderator, moderator Maura Brophy. I have, uh, like many here, do life in research and academia. I'm Dean of Research and Graduate Studies in Ireland's newest university, got minted on Friday, the Technological University of the Shannon, Midlands Midwest. So it's been a busy weekend for me, but I'm also a fiction writer. So I'm, this is my book plug, it's called uh, After the World, and there's a new book coming next year as well. So I'm going to start off our panelists with a question about, is it possible to have a hopeful future um, and how can we take those steps in that direction i'm going to throw it to her own first uh yes uh we should start with uh, um say uh, my previous panel was on uh, labor organization so we should start with a general strike i suppose uh but um in, in general no. <laughs> sorry after this <laughs> Optimist futures, I am, but sure, because um, the uh, we obviously need a paradigm shift. We we can't reform this. We we just can't uh, keep on doing the same thing and ca can't keep tail uh, tailgating the the curves and saying, okay, this is how far we can go in um, in emissions and whatever else. We should just uh, oh yeah, 
with with a change of thinking, and I'm not providing any solutions at this point. Yes, we can have a, a hopeful future. Okay. And Vanessa, would you like to come in on that? Oh, I I'm I, I'm solidly on that same side. That I I I think not only can we have a hopeful future, I think we have a hopeful future right now. I think we're at a kind of a turning point right now, where enough of a critical mass of people and organizations are are finally following the curve around to change the, the course because I, I've seen it uh, resisted for so long and finally we're seeing um, even major organizations say yeah yeah we need to reduce our carbon imprint and uh, and move forward and change things and that is just heartening after decades of like in my experience waiting for it to happen. So I'm I'm immensely hopeful right now. Excellent. Um, Noel, yeah, I'll ask you to come in on that. Yeah, I, I would agree that I'm also quite hopeful for the future, even though there are huge challenges ahead. Um, and it, it's, I'm not just feeling hope because I've been reading Oshin's book as well, Short Hopeful Guide, right. Climate Change. Um, I think in terms of maybe one thing we, we could all do and what's the first thing, I mean, gathering together like this and talking about it is, is great, but often in these sort of forums, the types of people who come are the people who are already on board, you know? So I think what one thing we can do anyway is to try to spread that a bit more so that we can talk to our colleagues, friends, people that are moderates, people that aren't really active or engaged at the moment and just try to, you know, <sighs> persuade them with um uh you know the, the the consequences that they might try to try to get them to understand and so on rather than just um rather than concentrating on us meeting together but try to spread it a bit further i think that is is a huge challenge but yet either by you know on your twitter platform or whatever you you you, you whatever you, you you talk on or just among your friends i mean a book a book can sell millions of copies by word of mouth so Taking that an example, you know, run with it and, and spread the word around. It's great. Okay. Oshin, you, you wrote the book on being hopeful. Well, yeah. Um, and uh, people people actually pick up on that title a lot. It's it's interesting that people kind of there's a need, you know, for hope. And I think um I mean, I, th I think there are different messages for different audiences. Um, I think a lot of the time, the ones we hear are where, you know, if you have scientists talking, they're trying to reach out to world leaders and, and people who affect policy. And, and those messages can be very negative because it's a really serious issue. Um, and really the kind of more influence you have over what, you know, the world or even your country, then the, the more nightmares you should be having about what, you know, what could be coming. But on the other hand, I think, um we uh, it's a bit like you're saying well we, not just about having hope but actually we have to have we have to have the belief that we can change this thing um it's a bit like saying you know if you're falling forward are you going to put your hands out and try and catch yourself or not you know i don't think there's much of a decision to be made we have to we have to believe in this and we have to believe that we can we can have a control over it and um, my focus, the kind of my approach is very much shaped by going, you know, going to rooms for the teenagers who don't, who aren't interested in this subject and trying to get them engaged in it. Um, so I'm always looking for the things that, that have an intimate connection or can provoke um, empathy in some way. And, um, and there, are, there are loads of things going on. I mean, it, we, we sometimes feel like because the change is slow, that we've really just started or that you know people are only just paying attention and we forget that people have been working on this for decades you know and and it can feel really slow this change this i mean but we are changing you're talking about changing an entire planet and, and the habits of you know a population of a world so it's going to feel slow um but even the last year or two the, the, the changes have been you know some been amazing changes and it's funny like while i was writing the book and researching the book I could feel changes happening. There was stuff I wasn't catching up on because it was just happening as I was doing the edits or just after the book was finished. Um, there were so many things happening. Um, and I think we, we need to kind of hear more about those things um, and feel like we're part of a big movement as opposed to, you know, um, feeling disconnected from it. I think thinking of kind of trying to overcome that disconnection mm -hmm. and realizing that it, because we're causing it, that is a reason to kind of, you know, to be hopeful because it means we have an influence over the outcome. And I suppose, yeah, that sense of it, 
being overwhelming. And um, I just want to say for it, I'm going to swing back to Noel in a second. I just want to say, I, I forgot to say, if you've got questions, if you're in the audience, if you've got questions, you can put them in the Twitch chat and they'll be sent through to us as well. Noel, so you wanted to come in there. Yeah, just, just to kind of pick up on something she said about momentum. Um, you know, as, as you explained, Oshie, this has been going on for a long time. People, very clever people have been looking at this for a long time and looking at solutions. It's not just this year or last year. Um, so it was it was a, a tweet by uh, Kier, um, Kieran Koff, a European MEP, saying that, you know, he's working on so many different policies and that are going through Europe at the moment, environmental um, type uh, policies, and that it's just so slow and things take, take a long time because it's 450 million people you're trying to bring along with you. But once you get those 450 million people behind you, I mean, that's a massive amount. So, I mean, building that momentum is worthwhile. It's taking time. I hope we're getting there. It's, it's, it is our main hope, I think. That's great, thanks. So, um, we, sorry, Ushin, did you want to respond to that? Uh, no, no, let somebody else take a go. Um, I'm sure um, everybody has something to say. Um, I suppose the panel description talked about, like, it took different types of technologies and that. Do you, and I know I have some good technologists here in the room, um, and so I might kick off with Vanessa. Do you have um, a concept of like what mix of technologies we'll use in the future to, to get our energy or deal with our energy issues? Well, I, I'm, I'm seeing it being as being relatively distributed energy generation because we're going more to uh, renewables in general and solar especially because it's so non-impactful and that gives us the benefit of having energy that's generated close to where it's used and that means we don't have to transport it and that means that we don't have to have as many massive uh, power connections between the places energy is generated and the places it's used and and if you're generating your power near where you're using it there's just kind of a closer sense of where it's coming from. And it makes it kind of uh, conceptually easier to understand that you need to conserve it some. Just because you're generating from renewables doesn't mean that you should just stop um, trying to manage your energy use. Um, uh, for example, I have, I have a few solar panels on my house. So I do think about when I'm using electricity because I, I will tend to try to use it more during the time of day that I'm getting free energy from the sun. And I, I think that kind of brings it home to us that uh, we're capturing energy and then we're also using it and we can manage at both ends. And we're gonna have to have big power sources. We will, I hope we'll have power sats because they're really fun, um, but we'll have big offshore um, wind turbines and we'll have uh, big solar farms and and we will move energy around but I, I think a lot of what we're going to see is a very disaggregated distributed energy generation and use and I think that's a good thing okay and um, Harun do you have a perspective on our technology uh sure um I uh, second what we just heard from Vanessa that it will be a combination of uh highly distributed uh both uh, uh highly distributed um renewable sources that uh, tune into the whole smart grid story of, uh, of the uh, imminent future. Uh, and that we will also have these uh, large, uh, large sources where, uh, where nature allows us. So be it uh, huge solar farms uh, where uh, insulation is just so, uh, so great or uh, be it uh, the large wind farms. Um, but uh, what, uh, what I wanted to flag here as uh, I don't have an answer or rather a question is um, how the business models are going to look, uh, look like around these uh, highly distributed, highly granular, granular systems. So the questions of um, ownership, energy as a service, um, uh, and a trade, uh, micro trading and uh, offsetting um, offsetting uh, someone else's carbon uh, with, uh, with your uh, production there, it's, uh, it's going to play very much into the, into the whole issue of um, whether we are going to see uh, results um, in terms of um, migrate, uh, mitigating the, uh, the climate change in the next few years, few years, few decades, rather. Thanks, Noel, as a, as a practitioner on the grid, 
<laughs> What's your perspective on this? Um, yeah, I, I think definitely agree with the whole solar side of things um, mentioned already there. Um, the sun is out there the whole time. It's shining away. There's energy ready to be scooped up if we can just get our act together. We have the technology has come down in price so much in the last while um, that we just need to, to figure out how to scale that up better and to roll it out. Um, in terms of being sustainable as well, the, the kind of the life cycle of those solar panels and what to do with with ones once they're spent. I mean, do you try to recycle them? Do you, and then do you dispose of them properly? That's that's very important for the life cycle. Um, like yourself, Vanessa, I've got solar panels on the roof. Uh, we met something like 45% of our energy needs last year, which is fantastic because um, we have an electric car as well. So like we're we're all in there. And I think to to make um, to make this more accessible to people is is very important i mean we we were lucky with the the time and the money to invest in that but not everybody does um even if you have big grants they might not be big enough for a lot of people so getting the policies right where you can get people on board either with their own domestic solar um or then large scale is, is going to be another part of it and i think a mix of large scale and and, and the distribution size is going to have to be part of it because not just because that's how we've always done it but because there are a lot of um, kind of economies of scale that you get when you have a, a large solar array. And then, I mean, that's just one side of it. The whole wind side is huge. In Ireland, um, we've nearly 30 something, 40% of our electricity came from wind last year. So um, there's a huge potential for upscaling there even more with offshore. Um, in the future as well, in trying to balance everything, uh, storage is going to be even more and more important because there's no point, as we have seen recently, when when the wind isn't blowing and when a couple of your gas power stations or your other options aren't available, then you're, you're getting into trouble with um, supplying all the demand. So storage can be, um, they're, they're looking really intensely at using hydrogen as a form of storage, as in you get your wind turbines when you're having lots of wind to make hydrogen, and then you bring that on shore or wherever it's needed, either to use to burn it, to, to, to then make gas or to, um, um, it, it, it could be used in transport as well. So the, the, the whole hydrogen issue is, is huge and potentially huge coming down the line. So effort in getting the policies right, getting the um, incentives right. Um, okay. I could go on more about... Just to say, so it's really complex. We're not just yes. talking about sources of energy, distribution models, we're talking about business models, we're talking about storage and all that, capture storage and all that. Oshin, you must have seen a lot of this when you were putting your book together. And, and Yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated with the, it's kind of almost a democratization of, of energy in that, um, you know, energy used to be a really large plant somewhere that ran on a fossil fuel. It, it, had, it took wealth to build it and it took wealth to run it and it made you know, a small number of people wealthy. And now we still need the bigger scale projects because we need that kind of stability, but but also more and smaller and smaller projects are making more sense now. So things like having um, micro generators on, um, on rivers rather than having a big dam can be more effective or, um, and in every place, the power generation is becoming more responsive to the environment simply because we have to look at each environment and say, well, what's the one that makes sense here? Um, and that becomes really interesting. Aaron um, referred to the, the smart grid, the idea that, you know, if one place is producing excess energy while another isn't, then we have a we have a system by which that energy gets transferred to another place. And, and that's what they're kind of working towards across Europe. Um, and it's going to be really interesting because it means that, um, you know, we wind is our biggest kind of renewable and it is going to be for a while until they sort tidal really. So. Um, so we will have excess wind, you know, at time, but it won't be all the time. Um, and we're pretty, we, I mean, when solar becomes a bigger part of our grid as well, people go on about, oh, we don't have getting much sun in Ireland, but actually we get something like 80% of what Spain gets in terms of radiance. And we also get rain that rinses off the panels. So they're more efficient. It, it kind of, you get less dust on the panels because we have rain. Um, so each and each place has its own kind of idiosyncratic um, form of power or could have. Um, and that that's brilliant in terms of both people having access to it, but also um, it being more responsible to the environment it's in. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm fascinated with this stuff. I mean, we're, it's it again, it feels slow, but actually, if you think about how long it took to get the energy set up that we have now, the network of kind of plants, you know, power plants, 
How long did it take us to get to that point? And now look, we're changing the entire thing over the space of a few decades. Um, I mean, it's incredible stuff to watch happening. I mean, solar is now the cheapest form of energy there has ever been. Um, and we're still in Ireland, we're still kind of adopting it. We're still kind of catching up on that. Um, on that note, and Oshin, I'm going to ask you to answer this next question first. It's from it's from the Twitch, right? It's Twitch question from Claire Cat. Have the panel heard of Cassandra Freuder, the feeling that everything is going wrong just as you said it would, but nobody believed you? <laughs> um, I, I don't have that feeling myself, but I'm sure there's an awful lot of people who've been involved in this for a long time are, are definitely having getting that sense. I mean, I think particularly from the news, I think there must be an awful lot of scientists who've been kind of crying out about this stuff for so long. And now they're seeing it in the news every day, you know, and, 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 and when you have, I mean, I think the, the kind of the protests of all the teenagers who, who started the, the climate change protests, you know, a few years ago, even though people had been talking about this stuff and protesting it and, and, and trying to raise awareness of it for a long time, that felt like a, a refreshing of the message. Um, I think that gave, gave a lot of people kind of spirit. Um, but yeah, I'm sure I, I know. Um, I'm trying to remember, there was a message, I can't remember the name of the guy, but he was, a, he was a climate scientist and he was referring to the methane rising up in the Arctic Circle, I think it was the Bering Straits, and he says, that we're fucked, you know, when this started coming up, that was like the kind of case of, I've, I've been trying to say it for so many years, and now this is happening, we have methane rising up, you know, we're, we're kind of coming at this thawing methane hydrate. Um, so I'd say, yeah, um, I, I, I often think, I often wonder about their, there's some of them, their mental state must be in, in terrible shape, you know? But now I think, I think it is slowly turning and I think that must be giving some hope. I want to ask Vanessa, have you felt like a Cassandra at times? Uh, well, I indeed, because I've been working in the industry for so long. I mean, the, the, the issue of climate change is older than perhaps most people know. I mean, when I was a graduate student, and I'm not sure I want to say how long ago that was, we had books on the shelf uh, forecasting this kind of problem, which is why I went into uh, alternative energy uh, uh, elements. In fact, what I ha had specialized in for a long time is energy storage. And, uh, and, and combined forms of energy, like uh, combining generation of, of heat and power and things like that, because, because of that, <laughs> for that reason. And I, I think the thing that has kept us going over these decades of hoping that people would catch on that why we were doing it is, is by taking action, by working in the field, by uh, working to develop energy storage by working to develop ways to model energy systems so that we can move energy around uh, efficiently and uh, get the power where people need it without <laughs> losing it along the way. Um, that by by working in the field, uh, we've been able to, you know, fend off <laughs> the, the the depression. <laughs> that you get when you realize that um, the, the movement that you want to happen isn't happening as fast as, as you wish. And, uh, but the, the continual refreshing of the, the urgency and uh, new people coming out and realizing that it's a problem and the fruit coming to fruition of some of the technological developments that so many people have been working on for so long is heartening. I mean, even in the midst of the state I live in, in California, being on fire regularly uh, every year because of climate change, even in the midst of that, that, that these technologies are, 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 are coming to us now and that we are able to leverage them um, is, uh, is hopeful. And that's what, that what keeps us going. Okay, that's wonderful. I'm going to fly that we're here at, at, at Octacon, right? So I'm going to ask, Start with with Harun. I would ask how how has fiction inspired your activism and work in science? Oh, so definitely, I'm young enough uh, to to be inspired by uh, say that one of my first inspirations was uh, was the early work of Cory Doctorow, and um, that uh, it it sort of was uh, hopeful. Uh, 
while uh, while also showing the grim uh, potential of the technology and uh, and the change in uh, in the community we have seen uh, since 9/11 and uh, the uh, growing uh, climate anxiety etc so uh, with that in mind i uh, I started seeing the uh, the potential in making the change through through both fiction, nonfiction, and technology. And um, I just wanted to briefly just go back to the Cassandra effect, yes, bit, uh, where uh, for me it's mostly I, I'm just making trivial observations most of the time and telling people, you know what, exponential growth cannot go forever. Uh, we're we're going to run out of something uh, at some point, and. Uh, for me, that was the case of Moore's law, uh, where um, there is this um, scheme in which uh, the uh, computers get uh, get better uh, at an exponential rate, but uh, we have reached the physical limits, and uh, we need a paradigm shift to uh, to continue the growth if we want to continue the growth in the first place, and uh, the current computers being that inefficient. Uh, energetically for computation, uh, inefficient in terms of uh, yeah we're not uh, achieving what uh, what we imagined with uh, with Moore's law and um, exponential growth. That pretty much uh, got me saying for the last say five years or so. Yeah, I told you so. But it doesn't really change anything. So it's, it's not a useful phrase sometimes. Um, Noel, I want to I want to know if you have been a Cassandra and if there's fiction that inspired your work. If I've been a Cassandra and been shocked by the the, the, the latest warning, um, warning everyone for a long time. I, um, I probably haven't been shouting about it um, like that, but I, I can imagine what it's like for the scientists who have been, um, you know, going on and on about it for for for, for so many years. I suppose what what kind of you know listen to the news recently that's been getting worse and worse with wildfires and flooding and the whole lot, and I kind of think, oh yeah, that's that's dreadful and. But I'm a bit isolated from it because I haven't personally f felt the effects of the of having a um, a wildfire. I've had a couple of really nice summers and getting doing a bit more swimming in the last few few years. But um, I, 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 one thing that struck me recently, I was walking around our our GA grounds with um, some of the people in in our biodiversity group, and it was just pointed out to me that there's no there's no birds here, Noel, and I'm like. And he and he was saying like you, you never see birds up around the fields here because it's just grass. I mean, what, why would they be hanging around here when it's just grass? Whereas we were talking about the you know the park on the other side of the hill where there is a lot more you know hedgerows and and now they have meadows there as well. And you're always hearing birds up there. And yet down at our lovely green fields, they're lifeless. You know, so um, that's just a small bit of biodiversity loss that has been happening right in front of my eyes that it hadn't you know kind of been pointed out to me until until this moment I caught yeah we, we need to do something about this we need to start planting we need to manage it better or whatever we do, need to do um so that was a little moment for me recently of, of kind of waking up to what's actually there on my doorstep um, um so in relation to the work you do and you're obviously involved in science fiction and fantasy is there fiction that inspires you to do this work and get engaged with it yeah, I mean, definitely for, for me, it was Star Trek um, that got me into science and astronomy. Mm -hmm. And I just love their their hopeful view of the future where, you know, they've kind of sorted out the problems on Earth, like hunger and wow, well, isn't it great mankind is you know, all, all together. They had this prime directive. They even knew how to deal with new worlds, at least in theory. Um, it didn't always work out so well, but um, I did. I did. That really spoke to me as a teenager in terms of a hopeful future that you know we, we would like to go towards rather than what we were facing um got me into science laser engineering um the story in um star trek 4 i think where they had to go back and get the whales i mean that was a real like talk about a strong environmental message banging you banging you over the head like if you don't look after the whales you you, you won't have them in the future um so yeah that that would be my prime um influence there Hey, thanks well. Ushina, have you been inspired by fiction to get involved in this activism? Um, thing? Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to remember, think of specific examples. I, I kind of had a, a weird um, track into this in that I, I started off, I've been writing since I was about six or seven, and it, a lot of it was science fiction. Um, and I was really illustrating my stories as I went. 
And then I kind of stopped writing a bit during secondary school because all of a sudden I had to think realistically about what I wanted to do. And I didn't know anybody who wrote. I didn't know anybody who made a living from illustration. Um, it seemed to be something that was far off. Um, and so I thought, well, I need a proper career. So I started looking at zoology and I got seriously into that for first couple of years of secondary. Um, and then I did the art exam in the intercert, which is now the, the junior cert. Um, and I enjoyed it. I had a good time. Um, you're not supposed to enjoy these exams, you know, that's not what they're for. So I thought, well, maybe that's a message. So I, I got more into the art and then I started kind of reading more comics. So there was a, I mean, a lot of the stuff I was reading at the time was science fiction or fantasy um, or historical stuff. Um, but I think, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to remember kind of the early stuff that would have been of that theme. I mean, J.G. Ballard's Drowned World or I was reading a lot of dystopia stuff um, and watching a lot of dystopian films. And I think that was a way, one hand, it was kind of an escapism because you're thinking you're beyond the kind of the, the normal concerns of the world. You've now got it down to, right, you have to survive. And there's only so many resources around. And I think there was something about that appeal to me in that it made decisions simple. You know, the, the world is ruined. Now you just have to kind of focus on the basics. Um, and it made very, very dramatic storytelling. But I never thought of it as a, as a, potential future really I thought no we've got all this sorted there was an awful lot of stuff I thought we had sorted um, and found out we hadn't so um, I think yeah I think there was a point where I realized no there there this possibility I mean we were, as well grew up in a time when there, there was a very strong possibility of a nuclear um, holocaust mm. as well so that was kind of always in the back of your mind <laughs> I was thinking somebody could just make a mistake and kill us all um, so I think it was, yeah, there was always kind of a sense of escapism. And then eventually the connection between the escapism and the potential for the situation to become real started mm. to dawn on me. Um, and that was a, one of, an early book, I, I, I um, referred to it in an earlier stage where I wrote Small Minded Giants, which was literally just about where we, we realized there's only some, you know, the resources are, are kind of extremely restricted. Um, but it's funny, I kind of know that you mentioned, like you, you ask about it, I'm just trying to think of specific examples of environmental kind of um, science fiction with environmental catastrophe or, but there, there were probably loads. I just can't think of any specific yeah. ones. Right. <laughs> generally yeah. what I was reading or watching. Um, yeah. you, you can always think on it, it comes back to you. You can interject with it. I want to ask yeah. you if, um, yeah. if, if fiction has inspired you in this way. Too. Well, I, I, I love that you mentioned uh, uh, J.G. Ballard because, uh, you know, I, I, I brought out one. <laughs> um, and, and indeed, I, I read uh, The Drowned World and his other uh, stories. Like the, the drought was especially, uh, especially keeps coming back to me over time because we, we have seen more consequences kind of like that from climate change. And in fact, in this story, the, the, the prompting problem for uh, the climate change was a, a misuse of energy generation. Now, this was before we realized that it was carbon that was going to get us. So, and ra radioactivity was the scary thing in those days. So it was uh, nuclear power had done something to shut down the ocean. So uh, that, that's what caused the problem. But it, because it was energy related and I was studying energy at the time, um, it, it really, uh, I, I have thought about this book this whole time, <laughs> even though I haven't read it very many times, I'll, I'll admit that. But uh, there are certain scenes in it that will just come back to me, um, people walking across a desert um, that were the, which had been uh, a bountiful place before just uh, resonates with me and I don't want I don't want us to go there. <laughs> well, there's yeah. the guy I'm just sure the name is the guy who wrote the day of the Triffids he wrote one oh, wrote Back oh, and Rising yes. and they so the, the kind of the alien underworld were using climate change they were they were melting the ice caps to cause havoc on land um, and I, I don't think he naturally he, he didn't kind of connect it to the climate then, but he knew enough about kind of rising sea levels to, to kind of use that real, you know, very mm -hmm. um, convincingly in the story. Uh, so there's been that kind of stuff. I mean, I particularly think around the 70s and 80s, people were extremely aware of, of environmental stuff. Mm -hmm. And there was a real thread of it throughout. I mean, even Mad Max or um, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff where you kind of feel like we, we're messing up the planet. There was a real sense of that. Um, and I think it really pervaded the culture. And I wonder if the nuclear threat sort of threw it, 
threw it off in the sense of it being a very immediate thing. And then when it's that threat dissipates, you're like, well, we're going to be here for a while. Maybe we should yeah. deal with some of these longer term issues too. Well, and, there's a basis of so many political thrillers. I mean, Cold War thrillers were a really big thing back in the 80s and 90s. And, oh, yeah. and really every, the, the kind of, the, the, the ultimate kind of loss or the ultimate kind of threat of each of those was like, if we get this wrong, the nukes will fly, you know? Um, and I think that, seconds. CND and all that became the kind of a lot of focus for it when in fact we were doing loads of other stuff that was going to mess things up as well. And yeah. so I'm, I'm, I'm going to, the next question is a kind of a combination of some technical ones. I'm going to start with Noel. So I have a question here about data centers. Data centers have been a bit controversial in Ireland lately because they're um, being shown to be a big drain on our national energy grid. Um, so there's a question about can we ever really look towards net zero? But then there's also a, a great question in from Twitch from GK Nibs about the progress they've made in the Orkney Islands about transferring power uh, excess back to the mainland to give us a bit of insight about how we might use infrastructure to actually get to that net zero. So I wanted to ask, start with you, Noel, about like, is that, can we really realistically think of that in the next few years of, of an actual net zero? Um, when you mentioned the Orkneys there, I was looking at, um, and I'd heard about it a while ago as well, where the there was a data center that Microsoft, I think, they decided they put it into a capsule and put it into the sea in, up in Orkney and see how it, it survived for the few years that it was in there. And they found that it was actually more reliable than one that was on land. And whereas the main reason was because they said it wasn't, there wasn't people, you know, walking up and down all the time, banging into things. And because they filled it with nitrogen rather than kind of atmospheric um, type gas. So I suppose that was a bit more stable. So, I mean, I think my, my main point is going to be that there is a lot of technological solutions out there. And um, that that's one that, that Microsoft had trialed for data centers um, in terms of actually, can we get to net zero? I think it's perfectly possible. I mean, it depends on the will. Mm -hmm. There's a great quote from Jean-Claude Juncker, which you might've heard before, and I'm trying to get exactly what it is. He said, and he wasn't specifically talking about environmental things, but he said, we all know what to do, but we don't know how to do it and get reelected once we have done it. So that just kind of speaks to the whole long-term, short-term um, challenges that we've had, like politicians trying to get things done. Uh, but yet then get re-elected next year so they can follow through on that five-year plan, 10-year plan, which is what you need when you're looking at energy infrastructure out to the future. You can't just think of five years down the road. You need to think of, you know, 2050 net zero. And the ambition to get there is huge. The technology is, it, it, some of it's, a lot of it is, is, is here now. We just have to scale it up. Some of it maybe mightn't be invented. And that is a bit of a, uh, a gamble, I suppose, to, to bet on something that hasn't been invented yet. But, you know, history would show us that things, new things do come down the line that we might be able to use in, in the future. Um, specifically for data centers, there's there's different ways of running data centers um, has been proposed like years ago, I remember reading about it where instead of, you'd actually think of your, your, your load on the data center, like the actual data being passed around the world, depending on following the sun where the solar panels are active in, in Ireland, you, you, you send all the, the videos of cats to Ireland to be recorded. And then when the sun moves on to the States, then you, you, you transfer the, the actual data load to the data centers over there and so on around the world following the sun. You could also think of a following the wind principle where if it's windy over in, I don't know, the Bahamas, you look, you use the data centers there. And then when it's windy in Canada, use them up there. So there, there are ways and means around it. Data mm -hmm. centers might be currently the big baddies in Ireland, but they're just another, um, there are another demands that we could accommodate if we really played it well and could benefit from it. But yet the policy at the moment does seem to have gotten a bit stuck, especially in the public realm recently. Ed Heron, do you have a perspective on this? Yeah, just to pick up on the uh, on the last bit there, policy. So uh, things will change if, uh, if there is evolutionary pressure uh, of sorts there to change. Because uh, if, if it is like this, like the game that we're playing right now, if we don't get the data centers, someone else will get the data centers. And uh, if, if we're chasing them in the first place, that's, uh, that's not going to fare well for the technology itself. And the technology has no reason to, to upgrade them. Uh, and uh, that's, that's pretty much my, uh, the point I wanted to make there. And um, also, uh, the second thing is, uh, something that I have completely forgotten. So let's just 
go go <laughs> go with the show and uh, okay. if i remember i'll let you know back in vanessa have you seen those those big new kind of trends in in energy and um, playing well it? yeah well with specific specifically with data centers it seems to me it's slightly becoming more a matter of corporate decision making than political decision making for you know here in the states uh you know microsoft is making a large just a huge deal that they're going 100 percent renewable and going to be net zero by 2030 even accounting for their backup power as not being diesel based which i guess currently their backup is diesel um so that's kind of a big deal and they're acting like they're their own government they're not being pressured they're certainly not being pressured by the u.s government right now to do that um and i was i was reading up that in in europe there's a there's a climate neutral data center pact uh, you know and and that's going to be very voluntary but a, a lot of entities have signed on to it so that's that seems positive um in in an action sense that uh that that companies are making these choices as opposed to governments mm -hmm. um probably for pr reasons <laughs> um but hey if it pr reasons means that we the citizenry of the world can exert pressure um through our pocketbooks and so that they're responding to us in in, in the, the way we vote in the marketplace so that 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 is another direction in which we can exert pressure as individuals. Thanks, Vanessa. Oshin, what have what have you made of these changes? Um, well, I think um, Oshin Coughlin and Friends of the Earth made a point about um, where we have a certain amount of emissions to cut in Ireland. That's we are we are obliged now legally obliged to do that, and because of our climate bill, <clears throat> um, and the more. We, the more any one section is adding to those emissions, the less the others get, basically, the, the harder the others have to work to cut theirs. So Haran's point of, um, the point of that, you know, if those if those data centers don't stop, come here, they'll go somewhere else. Um, that's a practical problem in having the data centers in your country, they're taking up an awful lot of that, that energy and, and giving off those emissions. Um, one of the reasons you put a data center center in the sea is because it cools it, and you know you you're using less energy to run all this data. But um, there's also, I think it might be the Amazon one actually. They're talking about using it to heat homes, so you're taking that heat and transferring it somewhere else, and that reduces energy use somewhere else. And uh, transferring heat has its own problems because you're always going to lose stuff along the way. But um, so it's it's how these things are connected up and how they they. Be, can be compensated for in other ways. But for Ireland, I mean, we've been very accommodating to the tech companies. And as a result, we get a lot of them coming here. Um, but we also means that means like, you know, we have to reduce our emissions farming. So they have to reduce more mm -hmm. if we have a data center burning up stuff somewhere else. Um, but I do think, again, it's it's how these things are connected up and how we can we can use them in different ways. I mean, bearing in mind that you know the fact that we can all meet like this means that we're not traveling you know we're not using a vehicle i'm not having to drive to dublin um how much you know how much is that saving so the data centers can be you know they they, they can represent a major positive um so it's it's using all these different things together and how well they're balanced i think is, is the key thing um but they are i mean in terms of emissions if they're not using green energy then they are a liability so it's a cost we'll have to bear somehow. Um, we just kind of perceive it's worth it, I suppose. They're coming, you know, I mean, I don't think, we're not gonna be banning data centers. It's, you know, certainly not in the near future. So uh, yeah. it's what we can do about them once they're here. Uh, yeah, so I, we've seen, so from everyone we've discussed, we've got these, this complex interplay of technology, of policy, of like our business models, of how we distribute things, how we use them. Um, so I, I suppose I want to ask you a little bit of more of a frivolous question, bearing in mind where we are today. So my question for you is, in 50 years, where will we be getting our energy from? Um, Harun, do you want to kick us off and tell us, uh, will I be using banana skins or something else to power my electric car? Harun, do you want to? I'm unmuting myself, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, uh, sure, 50, 50 years. If if we're still around, let's uh, let's have some uh, asteroid mining supporting uh, supporting our uh, 
uh, supporting our um, economy so that uh, we can uh, we can easily scale up our uh, renewables. So let's use our traditional renewables, traditional, uh, with uh, with the help of uh, what whatever we can uh, out uh, we, whatever we can source from uh, anywhere else. But uh, let's just try and make that sourcing a bit. Uh, a bit more realistic and a bit less um, colonial, colonialist in nature, and uh, just stop with the whole nonsense of uh, of infinite growth. And I remembered what I actually wanted to say, and uh, I need twenty seconds for that. Uh, it's uh, it's just that um, thinking locally, acting locally, great, but thinking locally for uh, for this is just not gonna cut it. Uh, net. Net zero, net means global, really, because uh, we we had the we had our um, trial uh, of uh, a global response with the pandemic. We saw how uh, what the inertia of uh, of the world governments and the the community that's so so connected uh, does to us. So uh, and pretty much in game theoretic terms. We are losing this game as long as uh, uh, everyone is not on, uh, on board with the game. And that's, uh, that's the only equilibrium in which we're gonna win this. Okay, thanks for it. Noel, what will we be powering ourselves with in 50 years time? Well, I suppose realistically, it's only 30 years away. Um, and the sort of things on the table at the moment would be for Ireland anyway, um, would be massive amount of offshore wind on floating platforms out in the Atlantic. Um, and then whether, you, you whether you've got cables for electricity bringing that to shore or whether you make hydrogen out there and then pump that back in and use that on land, um, that could be one way of looking at it. I, a, that's, that's, that's the main kind of realistic um, as well as maybe lots of solar panels and Mm -hmm. As as Ashin said, we don't have to put all the, the the solar panels down in the Sahara. We can have them here in Ireland, and they're still pretty good. Yeah. Um, the whole infinite growth um, being not possible anymore. I mean, that's 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 a great that's a great point. I think we need to to look at our natural capital, as in putting you know proper value on our on having a clean river and you know making that part of our GDP or, or whatever we want to call that in the future. Just putting a different way of, of valuing ourselves and, and our, our, our place in the world. And because if we don't do that, we'll then get into net zero. It will just be so much harder, I think. Okay. Oshin, have you got any uh, sources or new sources of how we're going to power things in 50 years well, time? 50 years is, <clears throat> given the, the speed that we're developing now, 50 years is a lot of time. Um, yeah. I mean, granted, there's so many kind of climate catastrophes locked in at this point um we, we don't really have 50 years but i mean if you're looking 50 years ahead um tidal energy if we crack that i mean that's ongoing it's it's never ending energy and in ireland we have the tide all around us um so but i mean you're also i mean there's there's a kind of a joke that uh, fusion energy is is always 30 years away um, we might actually get it cracked in 50 years. There's already kind of experimental fusion reactors um, being built and built, I think. I think France has one already and China has one. Um, so like you, we cracked fusion and, and we're flying, you know? Um, and there are so many other technologies now, both in, in terms of generating, but also in storage, um, mm -hmm. that 50 years with, with the, the will of the society kind of, locked into this and saying we are committing to this whole approach to our energy um i mean we're looking at a transformed world but the problem is that we're also going to be spending so much more money adapting to and dealing with the the, the results of climate change so um we're going to be held back in that respect because of the resources that's going to cost us and it's going to um but in terms of the um, the technology, I don't. I mean, there's a there's a risk in talking about technology as if it's a comp it's going to compensate for the, yeah, you know, yeah. save us from doing all the other things that we need to do. We're we're nearly out of time, so I want to give Vanessa Sorry, yes, to, to to tell us what we're going to be powered by. Uh, fifty years. Fifty years is a long time. I mean, fifty years ago, we were just driving gas guzzler cars around and burning all the coal we could find. That was fifty years ago. Yeah. So fifty years from now we need to have almost as much of a sea change. Um, I do think we'll have uh, orbiting uh, power satellites by then because 
uh, this year and next year where uh, people are putting up uh, test facilities. Uh, Caltech's got a project going. They're going to launch uh, something that will uh, uh, be a test bed in, in what next year or the year after that. Uh, mil the military is do is running experiments, not so much because they're the military, because they have a lot of money. Um, and so we're the the technology to make power sats possible is finally starting to come to fruition. So I, I think we're going to see that is what we're going to use to replace the combined cycle power plants and the coal, remaining coal plants and maybe even some of the nuclear plants that are uh, aging out. Um, so I, I think that's going to be our resource for major power uh, to supplement our renewables um, 50 years from now. Plus, we'll be you know we'll have people living in space then. So. Um, uh, you know, it'll be convenient and, and that'll provide jobs for uh, uh, people who are living in space. Excellent. So that will be a good thing, too. That sounds great. We are out of time. I, I want to thank the panel for such an interesting discussion. I want to thank the people who have sent us questions. Um, the next thing up is the closing ceremonies. So and thank you for all the audience who stuck with us to the end of the day. And um, thank you to, to the panelists today. Thanks, Noel, Oshin, Harun and Vanessa for your brilliant insights thanks very much mark thank you thanks much this was great fun see you next time